Hey, listen, today we're continuing our series called Faith Steps. We're continuing in Hebrews chapter 11. I hope you have a copy of God's Word. If you do, you might as well go ahead and start making your way to Hebrews chapter 11 right now. As we walk through this chapter, we're kind of investigating some of the great heroes of the faith. And today we're going to be looking at the life of Noah. And we're gonna look at the faith of Noah and what I want you to see with me is that Noah had an unsinkable faith. An unsinkable faith. You know, growing up, I loved watching late night talk shows. I I just enjoyed it. My favorite late night talk show host was David Letterman. Now, I don't love David Letterman, but I love his personality. I love his dry sense of humor. I also liked that he played games on his show. And my favorite segment was one that he would have about once a month, and he would call this segment, Will It Float? You remember watching Will It Float? Does anybody remember that? Okay, a bunch of us do. Will It Float? Now, I started thinking about Noah this week. I started thinking about what an unsinkable faith looks like, and I thought back to this game show, and I thought, man, we should bring that back to First Baptist Cleveland and just play a little bit on Sunday morning. So you guys put your hands together. We're going to play a little game, okay? Here we go. Here's how the game goes. The game is like this. They would show you different, different items, and then you would guess if that item is going to sink or if it's going to float. And so we're going to see how good you are at predicting this item. Coca-Cola. Do you think Coca-Cola is going to sink or float? All right, let's show of hands real quick. Loft, I hope you guys are participating as well. How many of you think the Coca-Cola is going to sink to the bottom of the tank? Raise your hand. How many of you believe the Coca-Cola is going to float on top of the water? Majority think it's going to float, okay? Let's see, ready? Drum roll, please. (laughs) Sink. All of you who said sink, give yourself a big round of applause. Let's go to a new item. Diet Coke. How many of you believe Diet Coke is going to sink to the bottom? How many of you believe it's going to float to the top? Most of us say it's going to sink. All right. There's only one way to find out. Drum roll, please. Drum roll, please. What? That's pretty crazy, right? How many of you drink Diet Coke? Keep drinking it. It's lighter. All right. Uh, Let's do one more item. How about this? How about a 12-pound bowling ball? How many of you believe a 12-pound bowling ball is going to sink to the bottom of this tank? Raise your hand. How many of you believe the 12-pound bowling ball is going to float on top of water? Raise your hand. If you're raising your hand, I want you to stand up. (laughs) Stand up and stay standing if you're that confident in your answer. People starting to sit back down. (laughs) All right, here we go. Drum roll, please. Oh, come on. Give yourselves a big round of applause. (laughs) Yep, that's true. That really just happened. Everybody's going to leave here today and say, what'd you learn in church today? 12-pound bowling ball will float. You guys give a big hand for my lovely assistants. All right, right, let's get down to the word. Listen, if there's ever a man who had faith, an unsinkable faith, it was Noah. And that's who we're going to talk about today. Now, remember from last week, if you're going to have a faith that pleases God, it has to be this kind of faith. You got to have faith if you're ever going to please God. That's what it says in Hebrews 11, verse 6. Now, without faith, it is impossible to please God. So what does that look like? Well, let me tell you what that doesn't mean. That doesn't mean that you have to live your life with some kind of blind optimism, just thinking, oh, it's, it's all going to be good. It doesn't mean you have to have some manufactured hope-so feeling. In fact, it doesn't even mean believing in spite of evidence. God-pleasing faith is taking God at his word and, and believing it. Taking God at his word and doing it. It's obedience to God's word despite the obstacles and despite the consequences. It's saying, I'm going to move forward no matter what. 
That's the kind of faith that Noah had. And we're gonna look at that, what an unsinkable faith looks like right here in Hebrews chapter 11, verse seven. It says, by faith, Noah, after he was warned about what was not yet seen and motivated by godly fear, built an ark to deliver his family. By faith, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. And so if we're going to look at the faith of Noah today, we can't, just, we can't just read this one verse and say, okay, he had great faith. We're going to go back to the original story in the very first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis. So take just a second and go all the way back to Genesis chapter 6. And from Genesis chapter 6, we're going to read Noah's story and figure out why his faith was so great. In verse one, it says, when mankind began to multiply on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of mankind were beautiful and they took any they chose as wives for themselves. And so in the very beginning here, you're gonna see what the days of Noah were like. This is describing the day in which Noah lived. And it says that the day of Noah was a corrupt day. The generation of Noah was a corrupt generation. In fact, this verse says that there were many sons and daughters being born. So it gives this, it, it gives this word picture of a population explosion happening on planet Earth. A population explosion that the Bible says is leading to a rebellion against God. All these people are being born and people are rebelling against God. In fact, it says the sons of God saw the daughters of mankind were beautiful. That's kind of a weird sentence, is it not? You say, who are the sons of God in this passage in scripture in the first place? Well, first of all, if you write in your Bible, I want you to circle this word, God. Circle that word and off to the side, I want you to write the name Elohim. Elohim. Say that with me. Elohim, that's the word for God that's mentioned right here in this verse. Elohim, as a side note, is a generic term for God. What that means is this. Sometimes Elohim is referencing the one true God, the God that we worship. Other times, even in the Bible, you see the word Elohim used to describe false gods, pagan gods, gods that are not real. And so the question is, right here when it says the sons of Elohim, what is that making reference to? Side note, right here it's used to describe fallen angels. Fallen angels and their involvement with the beautiful women of the earth. Long story short, it's saying in Noah's day, there is a sexual revolution taking place, not only with the people of the earth, but fallen angels on the earth. And now people were living in sexual sin. Verse 11 goes on to say, now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and the earth was filled with wickedness. God saw how corrupt the earth was for every creature had corrupted its way on the earth. While Jesus was still on the earth, he was talking about, at one point, the signs of the end times. Jesus was already talking about that moment when he would come back for his kids. And as he talked about the signs of the end times, he described that day when Jesus comes back by drawing a parallel to the days of Noah. He said, the day that I come back is going to be very similar to the day when Noah was alive. In fact, I'm going to read this passage where he's talking about that in Matthew chapter 24. He said in verse 36, now concerning that day and hour, no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the son, except the father alone. As the days of Noah were, so the coming of the son of man will be. For in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah boarded the ark. They didn't know until the flood came and swept them all away. This is the way the coming of the son of man will be. So what that verse tells us is, have you ever wondered what it's gonna be like on planet Earth when Jesus comes back? Have you, under, have, have you ever wondered what our country will be like, what the surroundings will be like, what our culture will be like when Jesus says, okay, it's time, and he comes back for his kids? Jesus said, if you wanna know what that day will be like, just look at the days of Noah, because they're the same. So what were the days of Noah like? Let me describe that culture for just a second. Sexual perversion all over the place. 
Blatant immorality everywhere you look. Violence. Rebellion against God. Rebellion against the things of God. Rebellion against the church of God. Rebellion against the word of God. Corruption everywhere. And all of those things were considered normal as a part of the world they lived in. Verse 39 said, they didn't know until the flood came and swept them all away. This is the way the coming of the Son of Man will be. When I sit back and I honestly, honestly observe the signs of the times that you and I live in today, I believe with my whole heart that it won't be long before Jesus comes back. I just believe it. The reason I believe it is because of what we see in the word of God. And I believe it's for that reason, knowing and believing that time is short. That we as Christians, we as God's people, we as God's church, we ought to be living with an urgency today. We ought to be living with an urgency among us, within us, to see the hope of Jesus and the gospel of Jesus Christ get to the people of our community and beyond more than ever before. See, that's why I believe we've got to do what God's called us to do. We have to move forward in faith. We've got to do what God's instructed us to do because the Bible says the days are numbered. It, it, none of us are going to get to that day and say, man, I wish we would have, wouldn't have gone for it like we did. I wish we wouldn't have been so aggressive when we were. Listen, God says it's time to be aggressive now. When you're talking about taking the gospel to impact your own community and beyond, when you're talking about doing what God's created you to do while there's still time, that's why we're here. And every single moment that passes, our opportunity to do what God's called us to do lessens. We don't have time to wait. Our time is now. God said, people are dying and going to hell now. Are you gonna do what I've asked you to do or not? So I just think it's time for us as the church to just decide, as long as there's one teenager that's lost, as long as there's one child, boy or girl that doesn't have hope, as long as there's one adult that's on their way to a real place called hell, we as a church aren't gonna pull back. Amen. We're not gonna pull up. We're not gonna give up, we're not gonna be content, we're not gonna just think this is all good, we're gonna move forward in faith and believe God to do something great. Because that's what God's called us as the church to do. Listen, we have to keep moving forward in faith. We have to. God's told us to. That's why we ought to be aggressive. That's why we ought to be a motive. Uh, that's why we've got to be motivated to keep going and to keep giving and to keep building and to keep sowing and to keep sharing the good news of Jesus Christ while there's still time. That day could be today. That day could be tomorrow. When is Jesus coming back? I don't know, but he said, get ready, because the days will look just like they looked in Noah's day. Look at Genesis 6, 13. It says, then God said to Noah, I have decided to put an end to every creature, for the earth is filled with wickedness because of them. Therefore, I'm going to destroy them along with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it with pitch inside and outside. If you keep reading, you're going to see how God explained to Noah exactly what he's supposed to build. It's like he gives him a vision of, and he says, this is what's next for you. This is what you're supposed to build. And if you keep reading in the story, you'll see Noah built exactly what God told him to build. He didn't build his own version of it. He didn't build a portion of it. He built exactly what God told him to build. Have you ever considered how crazy that was? Have you ever considered how, how crazy that must have seemed? Listen to me. Great faith will always seem crazy to those who lack faith. We got to get this. But my neighbor said, this is a really dumb idea. It doesn't matter what your neighbor said. Great faith will always seem crazy to those who lack faith. Think about it. Have you ever considered what God-pleasing faith really looks like? God-pleasing faith is believing God's direction even without having to see the destination. It's being willing to take that next step of faith, believing God. You say, I don't know where this is going to lead. I don't know what the results are going to be. I don't know what the outcome is going to be. It doesn't matter. If God tells you to take a step, you take a step. 
If God tells you to move, you move. Faith steps are hard. The world will say faith steps are crazy. But guess what? God says that's what God-pleasing faith looks like in the first place. Some people say, I'll believe it when I see it. That's not faith at all. Warner, Warner Von Braun, the father of the space age, said this. He said, there has never been any significant achievement in human history that was not accompanied by faith. Landing on the moon, going to Mars, it all started out with somebody believing it was possible. Somebody believed that it could happen before it was even considered a realistic possibility. And in the same way, God's called you and I to have God-pleasing faith. I believe it's believing God's direction without having to see the ultimate destination. Look at Hebrews eleven seven. 7. By faith, Noah, after he was warned about what was not yet seen. What in the world does that mean? What was what was not yet seen? Do you know the answer to that question? It was rain. What was not yet seen, right? That's talking about rain. He had never in his life seen rain fall from the sky. And now God was telling him, build a boat because a flood is coming. A what? A flood is coming. He had never seen rain. In fact, the world had never seen rain. Genesis chapter 2 verse 5 says the Lord God had not made it rain on the land. So up to this point in history, God had watered the plants and he had watered the trees with a mist that would, and I quote, come up from the earth and water all the ground. Up to that point, that's how, that's how everything was watered. So Noah had never seen rain. And because he had never seen rain, he had never seen a flood. And now he's having a conversation with God like this. Can you just imagine how this conversation went? God says to Noah, Noah, I want you to build a boat because a flood is coming. But God, what's a flood? Noah, just build the boat. Well, but God, I've never built a boat before. Noah, just build the boat. But, but God, I, I don't know where I'm going to get the resources. I don't know where I'm going to get the money. I can't do this. I've never done this before. Noah, just build the boat. But God, nope, Noah, stop talking. And just build the boat. I'm going to give you my instructions. I'm going to give you a vision. I'm going to give you the directions. And you can leave all the results to me. Your job, Noah, is to build the boat. You know what God-pleasing faith looks like? God-pleasing faith is obeying God even when it doesn't make any sense. It's obeying God when, when you don't have all the answers. I believe God gives us moments like these, moments that require great faith to truly reveal the state of our hearts. Do you know why Noah built the, the ark that God told him to build in the first place? Do you, do you know why he did that? He tells you in the verse, Hebrews eleven seven, 7, it says, by faith Noah, after he was warned about what was not yet seen and motivated by godly fear, built an ark to deliver his family. By faith he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. So when you ask the question, why did he build the ark that God told him to build? I believe he was motivated by three things. See, Noah built the ark because he was focused on the future. He was focused on the future. This passage reveals that Noah wasn't living for the present. He wasn't living to please the people around him. It wasn't a popularity contest for Noah. He wasn't thinking about today. No, he was thinking about tomorrow. He wasn't thinking about, is everybody going to think I'm cool right now? No, he was thinking about surviving until an, another day. He was, he was thinking about the future. He wasn't just thinking about the present. He was focused on the future. But the second reason I believe that he built the ark that God told him to build is because he feared God. Look at what it says in the text. It says he was motivated by godly fear. That was the reason for his faith. Now, the basis of his faith was the fact that God had already told him what to do. The vision was clear. There wasn't a doubt in his mind. God told him to build the ark, and his obedience to build the ark is the thing that God blessed. I mean, when you look at it, God credited this act of faith to Noah as righteousness. 
In other, in other words, his faith step was the means of salvation for Noah. And so, yeah, he was motivated because he was, he was focused on the future. He was motivated to do what God called him to do because, because, he, was, because he feared God. And but the third thing I want you to see, the reason he obeyed God and he built that ark is because Noah loved his family. He loved his family. Look at verse seven. It says, by faith Noah built an ark to deliver his family. See, Noah was motivated to leave a legacy. He built this ark to preserve his people, to preserve his family. He built this ark to be a safe place, a place of refuge, where the people he loved the most could gather, a place that would protect them from the storms that surrounded them. And so, yes, he was motivated by these three things. But what I want you to see in his story is this, that his motivation led him by faith to do it, to do what God said. See, faith leads to action. We can claim to have great faith all day long, but if our faith isn't supported by action, it's not faith at all. A lot of times I read this story, and the question I have for myself is this. Does my faith really honor the Lord. Not necessarily my life, not my words, not my actions. I'm talking about in the depths of my heart. When it comes to truly trusting God and living by great faith, does my faith put a smile on the face of God? See, Noah lived by faith. He had crazy faith. He went for it without knowing where the destination was going to be. And yet the question is, do I, do we? Do we live by that same kind of faith? See, God gives us opportunities to back it up, doesn't he? Generations phase two is just one of those moments. This isn't the final step for us as a church. It's just the next big step, the next big faith step for us as the church. And I just wonder how this next step is going to reveal the faith of our heart to almighty God. You see, for some of us, the decision that Noah faced in this story will be the same obstacle that you're faced with in the days to come. As you begin to ask God to lead you and to speak to you regarding your own three-year financial faith commitment above and beyond your tie to the church, for some of us, that number that God lays on our heart is gonna take us by surprise and it's not gonna make any sense. God's going to tell you, this is the number that I want you to pledge, or this is the faith commitment that I want you to commit, and you're going to want to argue with God. You're going to want to negotiate with God. You're going to want to try to convince God that there's been some kind of a mistake. And I can tell you this right now, because I've done the exact same thing with the Lord in the last month. God, I can't be hearing you right. That cannot be the number that you just put on our heart. That doesn't make any sense. And some of you are going to experience that as well. And you're going to become, begin to question God saying, God, I don't have that much to give. I don't have what's required for that commitment. And this is what God's going to tell you, just like he's been telling me. Hey, just build the boat. Just build it. You pledge it, I'll provide it. This is your by faith moment. Are you going to go for it or not? Are you going to hold back? Or are you really going to trust me? Just build the boat. You say, but man, now's not a good time for me. The next three years are not a good time for me. My business is in trouble right now. I can't think of a greater time to give sacrificially or faithfully than when your business is in trouble. When you need God the most, when you need God to show up strong, I can't think of a greater time to give in the way that God says, I will bless and I will honor. Anybody can give out of excess. We know that, right? You, 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 you got somebody with a huge portfolio and they take just a, a, a smidge over here. And they, I'll just give this little portion that I'll never miss. I'll never, I'll never think about again. I'll just give this to whatever God wants to do in his church. I'll just, I'll just give this portion over here. It could be a huge portion, but I'll just give it. I'll never miss it. Listen, God can't bless that. In the way God blesses faith commitments where we have to rely on him. God says it over and over again. He said, I want to bless your life. I want your cup to overflow. But that can't happen until you truly trust me. He gives us opportunities like these to put our money where our mouth is. 
Man, Audra and I have seen this happen in our own lives, in our family, time and time again. It's almost like the more we give God, the more God gives to us. The more we want to be a blessing for God, the more God blesses us. And I'm not just talking about finances here. That's a portion of it, but, but in a multitude of ways. But when we've given in faith, God's been faithful to give back to us in a way that in the end, it's like we have more now than we did even then. And he's blessed us. And as he's blessed us more, we've been able to be a blessing more and become even greater investors in kingdom work. And that's the way that God loves to see it happen. You say, Jordan, this is prosperity talk. It's not, it's Bible talk. I mean, look at the word of God. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 says, the person who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And the person who sows generously will also reap generously. God makes this very simple. And he makes himself very clear when he talks about our giving. He shows that when we are generous towards him, he is generous towards us. In verse seven, he goes on to say, each person should do as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or out of compulsion, since God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make every grace overflow to you, so that in every way, always having everything you need, you may excel in every good work. Some people read that and they're like, okay, God, fine, I give in, I'll do what you want me to do. You give it to me and then I'll just give it right back to you. And that's not how it works either, right? That's not faith. That's gratitude, but it's not faith. An unsinkable faith, a faith that's pleasing to the Lord, is one that says, okay, God, I will trust you even though I cannot see. I will obey you even though I don't understand. And that's the kind of the faith that, that God calls us to have. It's the kind of faith that Noah has in this story. In Genesis 7, 1, it says, Then the Lord said to Noah, Enter the ark, you and all your household. For I have seen that you alone are righteous before me in this generation. For those of you who write in your Bible, circle that word generation. It's a big word. The reason I want you to read that or circle that is because when you read that word in the Hebrew, it's a word that literally means to go in a circle. And I want you to get this word picture in your mind. To go in a circle. Just as the planet revolves around the sun, Noah's life revolved around God. In other words, God was the main attraction of Noah's life. God told him, I have seen that you alone are righteous before me in this generation. So in my mind, it's like God says, Noah, I have drawn a circle around all of humanity. And you are the one bright spot. You are the only one in that circle that's more attracted to me than you are to the things of the world. That's why you read about his life in Genesis 6, 9. It says, Noah was a righteous man blameless among his contemporaries. It goes on to say, Noah walked with God, just like his great-grandfather, Enoch. So how do I walk with God? It's very simple. You'll never walk with God until he's the main attraction of your life. When, when your life revolves around God, when he is the main attraction of your life, when you trust God like that, when you obey God like that, you will walk by faith. So how do I know if I'm there yet? When God becomes the main attraction of your life, you will naturally become a bright spot in a dark world. A bright spot in a dark world. When God circled humanity, he said, Noah, your life is a bright spot in a dark world. Because of your faith, you are a bright spot in a dark world. And you know what? That's what God's called you to do. That's who God's called you to be. He wants your life to be a bright spot in a dark world. And collectively, us as a whole, us as a church, God wants our church to be a bright spot in a dark world. Do you believe that the world is dark right now? Do you believe that the devil's on the prowl? Do you believe that, that sin is real? Do you believe that this world is, is, is getting darker and darker and darker? Do you understand that the time is now for the church to be brighter than ever before? And God says, church, it's time for you to be brighter. The world is darker. You need to be brighter. When I think about generations phase two, I don't think about buildings. I think about people. 
And I want you to think about people as well. Don't think about buildings. Buildings are part of it. But I want you to think about a place where thousands of people will gather week in and week out and hear the hope-filled, life-changing message of Jesus Christ. That's what this is about. I want you to think about a place of refuge for people that are hurting, people that are in great need. I want you to think about the boys and the girls that are gonna learn God's word, the teenagers that are gonna grow in their faith, the addicts that are gonna find freedom, the marriages that are gonna be restored, the men and the women, the senior adults that are gonna continue to be discipled and equipped for the work of ministry. I want you to think about our church becoming an even brighter spot in the dark world that we find around us. Genesis chapter six, verse three, it talks about the days of Noah before the flood happened. The Lord said, my spirit will not remain with mankind forever because they are corrupt. Their days will be 120 years. In other words, from that moment, the moment that that was spoken from the Lord, the world had 120 years to get right with God. That also meant that from that very moment, Noah had 120 years to build the ark that God told him to build. He said, man, that's a a long time to build a boat. That's a really, really long time. It's also a really, really big boat, right? But even with that, even with the 120 years, you've got Noah, and I asked the question, why was, how was he able to build this boat and do what God called him to do? How was he able to accomplish God's vision in that day and time? And I believe he was able to accomplish it by three things. First of all, by his faith in God. That's what Hebrews 11 says, 11, 7 says, is that by faith, Noah built the ark. By faith, by his faith in God. I don't think a day, a day passed where Noah woke up and said, you know what, I got this all by myself. I can build this thing. No, it's his faith in God. His faith in God's word, his instructions. He had faith in God. But it wasn't only because of his faith in God, it was also because of the favor from God. He had favor on his life. He had favor in that moment from Almighty God. Genesis 6, 8 says, Noah, however, found favor with the Lord. I promise you, he could not have built that thing by himself. But he had the favor of Almighty God, the blessing of God on his life in that entire process. And by the favor of God, he was able to build what God told him to build. But you see, there was a third component that allowed Noah to build that ark. And that is by doing the work. By doing the work. Listen, you can have faith that God's going to move mountains and you can have the favor of Almighty God. But until you're willing to do the work that God's called you to do, nothing's going to happen. He was willing to do the work. After God gave Noah all the instructions for the ark in Genesis chapter 6, after he listed every intricate detail of his plan, in verse 22 it says, and Noah did this. He did everything that God had commanded him. So here's the picture. When God gave Noah the vision, Noah was willing to do the work. He was willing to do what God told him to do. And it was his work by faith that turned that God-sized vision into a God-ordained reality. Listen, I just believe that this is our moment. I just believe that this is our time to do the work. 10 years ago, God gave our church a vivid image, a vision of where we were supposed to go next what we were supposed to do in the days to come. And 10 years ago, our church packed up and moved across town. Over 1,000 people made a walk in red shirts. Any of you part of that walk? A lot of them, okay. And that was a symbolic way of saying God has told us what to do and we are moving forward. And since that day, the vision really hasn't changed a whole lot. And yet now is the time where God is pointing us forward and he's saying, Trust me, move forward in faith. Believe in me, I will give you the instructions, I'll give you the directions, you can trust me with the results. Your job now is to build the boat.